Hello, and welcome to my series on the CT of thoracoabdominal emergencies. I'm Dr. Benjamin Strong, the Chief Medical Officer of Virtual Radiologic, or VRAD. I started my career with an internal medicine residency and followed that with three years of work as an emergency physician. I then returned to training for a radiology residency and a fellowship in body and MSK MRI. In the course of my over 20 years in radiology, I have worked as a private practice radiologist, an academic radiologist, and for the last 17 years as a teleradiologist for VRAD. I have been the chief medical officer there for eight years and am licensed to practice in all 50 states. Here is our agenda for this series, which I have broken into nine sessions of eight cases each, all grouped by organ system. Session two of our series is mediastinal emergencies. And we'll start this session with a case of an ASD with paradoxical embolism. Clearly there is a large filling defect in the aorta that is actually descending from the left subclavian. And we'll see that on later images. Precipitating all of this were bilateral large pulmonary emboli. And note as well, there is slight enlargement of the right heart consistent with chronic overflow. This patient has an ASD, which cannot be visualized. Actually, if you look in the septal region here, uh, that is artifact. I have uh, gone over and over it, and you really can't identify the ASD on the CT. But you can see the secondary effects of it in that right heart enlargement. There is the left subclavian clot and the aortic clot. And then here are the pulmonary arterial clots. And note again that slight right heart enlargement. So the sequence of events is important here in that there were bilateral pulmonary emboli, which resulted in a transient increase in right-sided heart pressures, causing then a reversal of flow across this patient's ASD. And that in turn resulted in the aortic clot. So that is an ASD with paradoxical embolism. Our next case is an aortic dissection with many complications. So here is the flap in the upper portion of the ascending aorta. You can see a fenestration within it, suggesting there's free flow between the true and false lumens here. Lower down in the region of the aortic root, you see another flap with another fenestration. Obviously, there is dilation of the aorta at this level as well. Here you can see the actual rupture on the right lateral aspect of the aorta, and it is leaking into the pericardium, a well-described phenomenon. And you can see the pericardium is full of hypodense fluid as well as extravasated contrast, and all of it is deforming the right ventricle significantly. So here we see the upper portion of that flap with its fenestration then an intact flap, and the lower fenestration. Now the focus of rupture and the leakage into the pericardium. So this poor patient had additional difficulties on top of this. He suffered a tracheal perforation when intubated. So there is gas in the soft tissues in the supraclavicular region. Lower down you can see the actual defect in the posterior trachea at the tip of that endotracheal tube. So there is the supraclavicular gas and mediastinal gas. And here you can appreciate that focal defect right at the tip of the tube. So never stop looking even in the face of such complex pathology. Uh, that again, an aortic dissection with intrapericardial rupture, hemopericardium, and an incidental perforation of the trachea. Our 
Our next case is an aortic dissection, this time with occlusion of the coronary artery. You can see it right here, the flap in the aortic root. And to the left lateral side, you can see it actually passes over the left coronary ostium. And there is no contrast opacification of the proximal left coronary system. Lower down, you can see the normally enhancing posterior and basal myocardium and some of the superior septal as well, but the region of the left coronary system is all underperfused and hypodense. So here we can appreciate the dissection flap right there crossing across the left coronary ostium and the lack of opacification proximally in those vessels is quite apparent. Here is the perfused normal posterior and basal myocardium. Probably worth another look. There's the dissection flap right there crossing the left coronary ostium and the lack of perfusion or contrast opacification in the proximal left coronary vessels. And there again is the normal enhancing myocardium contrasting with the underperfused hypodense myocardium. Here it is on the coronal. There's that uh, normally perfused basal myocardium. There's the flap. You can see on the left side where it crosses the left coronary ostium right there. And the unopacified left main and proximal left coronary vessels. So that is an aortic dissection with coronary arterial occlusion. Our next case is an aortoesophageal fistula, a very unusual condition. We suspect related to the long-standing presence of a nasogastric tube. But here you see contrast material in the esophagus when no oral contrast has been given. And obviously it's very much the same density as that in the aorta. Lower down, there is just a pinhole communication between the esophagus and aorta, which under magnification you can see is real. And it is that communication that's resulting in the extensive extravasation into the patient's esophagus. So here is the esophageal contrast. And there is that tiny pinhole perforation visible really on just one or two cuts. So that is an aortoesophageal fistula. Our next case is an acute myocardial infarct with ventricular rupture, the dreaded complication of a transmural infarct. You can see here that a uh, very ill-defined tract of contrast material extending through the left ventricular myocardium there. And obviously, a uh, pretty significant chemopericardium is present. Here it is on the cine. Right there, you can see a linear rupture through the myocardium, which is resulting in all of that hyperdense pericardial fluid, or hemopericardium. That is an acute transmural infarct with left ventricular rupture. Our next case is tricuspid endocarditis with septic embolization and tricuspid valve insufficiency, two common complications of this pathology. You see here a large mass of vegetative matter occluding the right pulmonary artery Fairly unusual to see it to this degree. Downstream from that, on lung windows, you can appreciate small cavitary lesions and wedge-shaped peripheral parenchymal densities, highly suggestive of pulmonary infarctions. On the soft tissue windows, you can actually appreciate a tricuspid vegetation. Again, an unusual finding. Note also, there is right atrial enlargement, and on the cine, hepatic venous backflow both suggestive of tricuspid insufficiency. 
here is that right pulmonary artery filling defect, and here the vegetation on the tricuspid valve. Note again the right atrial enlargement and hepatic venous backflow. Then on lung windows, there are numerous small cavitary lesions, most of them peripherally distributed, and wedge-shaped densities consistent with infarcts. So that is a case of tricuspid endocarditis. Our next case is of aortic endocarditis. This manifests as a paravalvular erosion or contrast collection there in the upper septum in the region of the AV node, which explains why many of these patients present with heart block. This is a common location for a ring abscess, a complication of aortic endocarditis. Note also a significant pericardial fluid collection, which in this case represents a pyopericardium. In the abdomen, there is evidence of embolic phenomena in the kidneys, the spleen, and even the liver, consistent with an arterial embolic shower. And here again, the paravalvular collection of contrast, denoting a ring abscess. And in the abdomen, we'll see the infarcts of the liver, the kidneys, and the spleen. We have a coronal here as well coming from the front. There is the erosion and ring abscess right adjacent to the aortic valve. And in the abdomen, the infarcts of the kidneys, clearly visible. So that is a case of aortic endocarditis with ring abscess, and distal embolization. Our last case in this session is one of distal arterial embolization related to an atrial mass. Here is a hypodense filling defect in the left atrium, which is the source of all the embolic phenomena we will see in the abdomen. Hypodensities of the liver and the spleen, as well as of the kidneys, all characteristic of arterial embolization. Note also the occlusion of the distal aorta. There are all those embolic phenomena. And you see now the source of it all, a large right lung mass extending down the pulmonary veins into the atrium then resulting in distal embolization and occlusion of the aorta. Let's look one more time. Here are the emboli of the liver, spleen, and kidneys, and the right upper lobe mass extending down the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, and ultimately the occlusion of the distal aorta. That is a case of arterial embolization related to atrial tumor thrombus. And that concludes session two, mediastinal emergencies. Thanks for watching.